Today we're going to look at one of the most fundamental laws in magnetism known as Ampere's Law, named after André-Marie Ampère, a good French physicist from the early 1800s. This has a lot of similarities to, to Gauss's law in electric situations. And before we jump into Ampere's Law, we're going to mention quickly um, where some of our units come from. So I said in our last video that we define mu naught as precisely 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7th. And where this comes from is if we start with one unit, then we need to build the other units off of that. And we want to start with a unit that is easily measurable in a, you know, a replicable situation. So it's easier to measure the force between two wires than it is to measure the charge on an object because charges are always jumping off onto other things and leaking off into the air. So it would be really hard to always measure a standard Coulomb and then base other measurements off that. So what we do is we say that if we have two wires that have their parallel and if they have exactly one ampere of current flowing through them, and then when they're one meter apart, they will give us exactly two times 10 to the negative seventh newtons per meter of length. And then we can just say that a coulomb is exactly one ampere per second. So by uh, changing our currents such that we get a force exactly equal to that, we're essentially setting this standard off of that definition. Okay, moving right along. Here is Ampere's law in all of its glory. If you remember Gauss's law, that was E dot dA was equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught integral over here. And this was a surface integral, and we had Gaussian surfaces and all of these things. Well, now we have B dot dL, and we again put this uh, circle here on our integral telling us that this is a line integral rather than a surface integral, what we have here, we've got dL. So we're gonna integrate around the edge of a closed loop. And that closed loop can take any shape we want as long as the ends meet up such that it is closed. So that is one half of Ampere's law. The other half is that we have the enclosed current. So that's the current passing through our Amperean loop. So before we had Gaussian surfaces, they had to be closed surfaces. Now we have Amperian loops, and then we also have our permeability of free space thrown in there just for fun. This is easiest to grasp by seeing some examples. So I'm going to go through a number of examples, and in fact, I'm not going to do a separate sample calculations video because most of the derivations and examples I do to uh, convey the concepts are also sample calculations. So just one video this time. All right, we can use Ampere's law to derive the expression that we already know for the magnetic field around a wire. So in this case, we want to choose our Amperian loop such that we have a high degree of symmetry here. We already know that the magnetic field is going to travel in circles. And so since this is a dot product, if we can choose a DL, essentially choose our Amperian loop so that it is parallel to the magnetic field at all locations, the dot product selects out the parallel component between these two vectors. So that is going to change this from a vector dot product to just multiplying the magnitude of B times DL. So again, B had to be constant. Actually, it didn't for this part. But for the next part, when we pull it out of our integral, B is constant and then the dot product goes away, so no more vectors, no more dots or anything going on here. So this is one side of our equation. The other side of our equation is just mu naught times the enclosed current. In this case, I have a wire carrying a current I. The enclosed current is I, so this is nice and simple. Now if we take the line integral, this integral of dl, that's the integral around the edge of our Amperian loop, which is just going to give us the circumference of that loop, which is 2 pi r, and voila, we have our expression for the magnetic field due to a current carrying wire, which is identical to what we have already used. So nice and easy if we have high degrees of symmetry and whatnot. Let's look at another example just kind of conceptually. Um, 
TVs used to always have these coaxial cables. You'll see, you'll still see them around uh, a bit, but not as ubiquitous as they once were. Um, I mean, they still use these for cable internet and whatnot. But if I, what they do is they have a current going one direction on the inner wire, and then the return current goes around the outer wire, which is usually some kind of weaved uh, wire on the outside. But if I want to find the magnetic field in the space in between, so right in here, and then outside the cable, well, for the inside part, if I'm using Ampere's law, B dot DL equals mu naught I enclosed. In this case, the enclosed current is just the current on the inner wire. So this is going to be identical to the derivation we just did. So for part A, we're going to get B equals mu naught I over 2 pi R. And similar to what we saw when we used Gauss's law, often the currents on the outside make no difference. We can ignore them because of this enclosed part, just like before we had enclosed charge. So that outer sheath doesn't make any difference for the magnetic field inside here. Now on the outside, not B equals, just B, uh, we've got B dot DL equals mu naught I enclosed. And in this case, current in one direction has to have one sign, and current in the opposite direction has to have the opposite sign. So if I make my Amperian loop outside here, the enclosed current is equal to zero. Therefore, there is no magnetic field outside of that coaxial cable. So this is another reason why these are really useful. Uh, it's a useful design for signal carrying wires. We saw earlier that this inner wire is shielded from any external signals by this outer uh, weave here, so you have a Faraday cage essentially. But also you're not going to produce stray fields, at least not stray magnetic fields, uh, that will affect other wires nearby that you don't want to be disturbed by this wire. Okay, so the general approach, what we saw in that one we just did, well, in general you want to have a lot of symmetry, otherwise Ampere's law is really ugly. That first example I showed you where uh, it had this jagged Amperian loop going all around, if you had to find the perpendicular or the parallel component to the magnetic field at all locations and if the magnetic field were changing, that would just be a nightmare and you would not want to use that approach. So this again is limited to um, situations where there's a high degree of symmetry. Uh, and then kind of general uh, approaches, you want to make your, your Amperian loop the path along lines where the field is constant, so you want it uh, parallel to the constant field, if that's the case. If the field is changing, you'll often want to make your Amperian loop perpendicular to that field if possible, and you'll need to determine the enclosed current. In the examples we've seen so far, it's pretty easy, but sometimes uh, it's a little more tricky to figure out exactly what current is enclosed. So let's get to those other examples like this one here. <clears throat> if we want to find the magnetic field outside the conductor as well as inside the conductor, so we just have a current carrying wire, well outside is the same one that we've already done twice already, right? So let's not waste any more time with that. It's the entire enclosed current is I over uh, 2 pi r, so that is just the field from a wire. Now the inside gets a little more interesting mostly because of the enclosed charge part. So let's start from the beginning, B dot DL equals mu naught I enclosed. Okay, B dot DL again it's just going to give me B times 2 pi R by all the same arguments that I used before. The one thing that's different here is my enclosed current. I'm going to come over here and calculate that enclosed current. So I am at some distance here, so not all of the current is flowing through that Gaussian, not Gaussian, sorry, that Amperian loop. If we take the total current and divide it by this cross-sectional area of the total wire, that will give us the current per unit area, and then we multiply that by the area enclosed in our Amperian loop. So I'm going to have Y over, not Y, I, <laughs> over the total area of the wire, is going to be pi big R squared because it's a wire of radius big R. And then so this is essentially my current <coughs> per unit area. 
Now I multiply by the enclosed area here, which is going to be pi times little r squared. And I can go ahead and plug this in over here. The pi's will cancel out. So I'm going to have i times little r squared all over big R squared. One of these r's can go away, and I can solve for b. I get mu naught over 2 pi. I'll put the r squared over here because all of this stuff is constant. And then I've got i times r. So there is the magnetic field inside the wire. And you'll notice for constant r and constant i, this actually increases from the inside, from the middle of the wire out until you get to the surface. And then it will start decreasing. So if you were to graph that, uh, the magnetic field as a function of little r it would increase linearly and then start dropping off as an inverse according to this expression here. Okay, a couple more examples because there's some really common um, elements that that use magnetic that are used to create magnetic fields and are used in different uh, circuits and electrical components. So this is called a solenoid. You just have a loop of wires and we have already looked at the idea that if you have a single loop it produces a magnetic field going um, you know you use a right hand rule and you curl around the loop and your thumb points so the magnetic field will always be uh, perpendicular to the face of the loop you know pointing this way or that way depending on which way the current is circling around your loop so if you have this device here known as a solenoid you just have a whole bunch of loops and they will all be producing magnetic fields uh, in the same direction so you get something that looks like this uh, if you take you chop this in half the field will be pointing in one direction and these are uh, pretty ubiquitous little devices uh, because if you stick uh, like a piece of metal in here then you turn the current on it creates a magnetic field that piece of metal will go shooting out so you can use that to ring a bell or a whole bunch of things the starters in your cars use solenoids to engage um, the, the sprockets with the uh, what's it called the flywheel anyway now you might think if we're going to apply um, Ampere's law to this situation you might want to look at the end of this so here's the coil and you're looking end on you're gonna have some magnetic field <clears throat> it's gonna be strongest in the middle but there will be a little bit of magnetic field on the outside as well. Often we're going to ignore that. Well, if I look at that situation and I take my Amperian loop, if I put my Amperian loop inside here, oop, not that way, okay, if I put my Amperian loop in here, well, what is my enclosed current? Zero, so that's not going to work. Uh, if I put my Amperian loop out here, uh, I would have a current flowing through that. I guess if your loop was kind of like around here, you're going to have a a current eventually working its way through that loop but if we think about that magnetic field it's going into the page in my example and my Amperian loop is going in the plane of the page so those are perpendicular to each other and if I'm using B dot DL I want the parallel component so that works out to be zero if I only have perpendicular DLs and B's so we can't look at that picture there it's not going to help us uh, what we're going to do so we're going to look at the picture down here and we're going to make our Amperian loop as a square. They don't always have to be uh, circular loops as long as it's a, a closed path. Okay, in this situation here, we're going to ignore the magnetic field on the exterior because it's so small it's going to be negligible compared to the magnetic field on the interior. These two vertical segments DL is going to be perpendicular to the B field because the B field is running this way and that line is running that way and so those are perpendicular same thing here so the only contribution to the B dot DL term is going to be along the line horizontal line on the interior here so again this becomes uh, B times DL because they are parallel the B field is constant DL is going to be the length of this Amperian loop segment, so it's what we called L. And then mu naught comes along. Now the enclosed current, since I've got the current coming out here and then it doesn't go the other, or in here, sorry, it doesn't come back until this side, which is outside of my loop, I actually get to count the current every time that I've got a loop going through here. So I'm going to use an N for the number of loops that are enclosed in my 
and period loop, the number of windings, and then I have that times the current that is flowing through everything. So if we solve this for the magnetic field, we get this expression all over L. And what we typically do, not typically, but often enough, is we combine the number of loops divided by the length of that segment, and we call that little n, which is going to be the uh, windings per unit length. So it'll say like 50 windings per centimeter or something like that. Uh, essentially, this is the more common form of our magnetic field from a solenoid. But this is a good way to create a really strong magnetic field. That electromagnet that I showed you in class had a whole bunch of windings. And so it was essentially uh, acting as a solenoid with a large n value. And so that just magnifies your magnetic field. A solenoid, by the way, usually has real tight windings, more like this, uh, as opposed to the previous picture that looked kind of like this. But you would get a magnetic field running through the solenoid. Well, depending on which way your current's going, it could go the other way, but it will go along the, the axis of the, the long axis of the solenoid. All right, last thing we're going to look at is if you take that solenoid and you bend it so it makes kind of a donut ring shape, this is known as a toroid. And now we want to look at the magnetic field from a toroid. Here's a picture of an actual toroid. toroid. And sometimes they're more tightly wound, but uh, sometimes not. And these are often used in AC circuits. They have some other properties that we're not going to get into that are useful there as well. All right, here if I want to find the uh, magnetic field on the exterior of the loop, so out here, I can do B dot DL and the enclosed current on the exterior is going to equal zero because uh, any current that is flowing through the loop on this side flows in the other direction on this side so all of these will cancel out if it's uh, the current's flowing this way, so I guess it's coming out over here, and then it's going down there, and out here, and down there. For every out, there's also a down, and so all of the currents will cancel out of that Amperian loop. If I do my Amperian loop in here, by the way, so we'll say interior slash, or sorry, exterior slash interior, then obviously there is no enclosed uh, current there either, so we know that the magnetic field inside or outside of the loop is always equal to zero. The only place where there's a magnetic field is kind of within the toroid itself. So here we'll say within. And in that case, we will be able to find a magnetic field, B dot DL, B dot I enclosed. We know that uh, for a single loop, the magnetic field has to be perpendicular out of its face. So as we go around this toroid, we would have a, perpen uh, a magnetic field that's perpendicular at all locations. So we are going to get circular magnetic fields on the inside of this toroid. And we are taking our uh, Amperian loop also as a circle. So once again, the dot product goes away and we just multiply those two things. And then we'll talk about the enclosed current in a second. B dot DL is just going to be B times the radius, or the circumference, sorry. So 2 pi R. The enclosed current, here I've got all of the ones that are coming out, but I don't have the currents going in. So again, I can multiply the number of windings times the current, because there's the same current in all of the loops. And we end up with a magnetic field of mu naught n i over 2 pi r. Now you might recognize this is really similar to the expression we had for um, for a solenoid where we had mu naught n i over l. We've just essentially called l 2 pi r now. But the interesting thing, and get this out of the way so you don't get confused by it later, the interesting thing about this is that the magnetic field is larger when r is smaller. So on the inner edge here the magnetic field is actually larger than it is on the outer edge, so it uh, follows an inverse curve there within the toroid. Okay, well, we made it through everything.